Hello, everyone. So today we have a very special episode. Two of my good friends, Grace and Dash, are going to share a little bit about their life stories, what it's like to be autistic, some of the struggles they face, and a few other surprise topics. So, Grace and Dash, thank you so much for joining. Thanks. Oh, thank you for having us. <laughs> it's me, Grace. I use she, they, fey pronouns right now. And I'm Dash, and I use she, they, fey pronouns as well. Awesome. You stole my pronouns. Yeah, I'm a dirty <laughs> pronoun thief. That, that is funny. <laughs> so, what was it like when you realized that you're autistic? Are you formally diagnosed? What was that process like for you? Dash, you can start. Okay, I can start. Uh, so, throughout my like life, I've had trouble socializing um uh especially like when i was like in elementary school in the beginning of middle school um i had a lot of trouble like trying to like make friends and stuff like that um i i i found it hard to like understand like why people were like making fun of me for certain like affects i had or or like or certain interests that I had, or the way I, like, I don't know, kind of, like, uh, express myself. Um, so I would get bullied a lot, and I also would get kind of emotional uh, for certain things. Um, and and also, my teachers didn't really help at that age, either. Um, my I, I did see a guidance counselor while I, while I was in uh, elementary school. Um, and my fifth grade teacher said that, um, I would never succeed in life that I, if I remained this quote unquote immature, um, Jeez. she said that to my parents. And other than that, I've never really been formally diagnosed. Eventually I started having a bit of an easier time making friends, but that did require a bit of masking on my part, um, which contributed to, well, Masking, looking back on that, I didn't know I had autism back then. Um, so, so it's a pretty eye opening um, to to realize that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, looking back, um, yeah, looking back, uh, masking to kind to kind of like try to like fit in and stuff, which caused a bit of like social anxiety on my part. Um, eventually, I came out as. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Eventually, I came out as trans um, in what year? To in twenty, well, twenty twenty, and then I um, started medically transitioning. Started twenty twenty one, and it was around that time I met a friend. Her name was uh, Iris, and Iris really helped me, kind of like under like gain kind of like a new perspective on the world it was like during that time i was undergoing a lot of like depression a lot of like body dysmorphia and stuff like that typical trans girl stuff sounds so, rough to deal with um and yeah and she uh one of the discussions she had is that she noticed that i had a lot of uh interesting like qualities that she has seen in other uh, her other friends who are autistic and so it was at that point where I started seeing a psychiatrist to see if I uh, was diagnosed, if I do in fact have autism and I do, and kind of realizing that I kind of just felt more comfortable being myself and uh, comfortable expressing myself like how I am. And also, of course, being uh, even before I came out as, or not came out, before I discovered I was autistic, I... Um, I kind of noticed that a lot of my friends were kind of of a similar type and stuff. Uh, Grace and I went to a fraternity called Psi Upsilon Gamma Tau chapter. And, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the people there are neurodivergent. Of, and it was that group that I had the easiest time socializing with when I came into, when I started college. Um, and so, yeah, in general, like once I figured out that I was that I was autistic, I kind of knew more about myself and the type of people I wanted to associate with and the type of life I wanted to lead that would, like, best suit, like, 
you know, my my inclinations and stuff like that. The type of people I want to be with for a long, long time. Looking at Grace. Um, and ultimately kind of my, like, I guess, leftist perspective on the world uh, and stuff like that. Uh, sorry if that was like a bit of a rambly response. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it sounds like discovering that you're autistic was able to give you a totally different perspective on everything that happened to you in the past. Oh, definitely. Um, of course, the past is the past. I would have loved to have had, because now I work in, uh, I actually, because, like, in partially inspired by me being neurodivergent, I have autism and I will be tested for ADHD uh, next month. Um, so knowing that I'm a neurodivergent really drove me, drove me to want to become a teacher to, um, to kind of like help people, you know, children going along that um, path in life and helping them socialize and helping them be able to be advocates for themselves and stuff. And, you know, right now I'm a preschool teacher. That's um, awesome. And my class, we have a lot of neurodivergent kids. We have, uh, and I, there's especially one that I'm really fond of. Uh, we 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 love like stimming together and stuff like that. And Aww. I think we've really bo- I think we've really bonded. He is he is adorable. He is a, he is such an adorable little kid. Um, but it's just uh, kind of mind yeah. blowing to hear that because you know a lot of people, me and other autistic people, go through life not really having supportive teachers or teach. Most of the teachers just don't really understand. Exactly. And so I kind of want to be that person that can, you know, help, you know, help the help these kids all, along in life and be that resource I wasn't able to have growing up. That's not to say I'm not, ha- I, uh, I, I'm happy that I am where I am now. Um, I will not, I, I will say that going through like, you know, being bullied and, ha- and having a hard time socializing, stuff like that, not the best. Not not the best not the best vibe, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But I am really happy that I'm here now, and I'm happy to, I guess, help um, help other neurodivergent kids lead lead fulfilling lives. Um, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. And I, I bet um, the experiences that you've had is also going to help you recognize it in these young children as well. Oh, for sure. Um, there are kids that I have, like, noticed that uh, actually they don't think have been treated yet for or for their autism. There's this kid who tends to get kind of overstimulated and um, has a lot of like, uh, and has a, like and like stims a lot and stuff like that. So and. I don't think he's been formally diagnosed yet, but as someone who is autistic and can kind of see it, has been more primed to now see it in other people as well. Um, I like that I'm able to like notice that and maybe like tr- try to act on it uh, sooner than the school can. But the school's also uh, honestly been really great about like neuro- neurodivergent people, like giving um, them accommodations and that sort of thing. Yeah, they they are they are fantastic about giving like kids accommodations. Uh, they have uh, counselors who like do interventions with the kids and stuff like that. Um, they um, allow like um, they they allow like um, uh, therapists to work alongside the kid the kids as they go about their day and stuff like that. Um, and the the lessons we teach we like we emphasize how we like through the literature we read and the lessons and um and stuff like that we try to impart like a culture of understanding and compassion in the students so that it's not just the teachers who support the the neurodivergent kids but also uh, the the um the community around them as well so um that's great so it, so it, it is a really nice school. I'm very, I'm very happy that I ended up there. That's awesome. It sounds like you're in a position to to really make a pivotal, pivotal difference in so many of these students' lives. Thank you. 
And I can't even imagine like what having that support like that from a teacher at such a young age, someone who actually understands in as a preschooler, like I can't even imagine how, how much that's going to benefit these students' lives. It's almost unfathomable. <laughs> it's almost unfathomable, honestly. Yeah. I'm I'm really happy that um that I guess like we didn't have these resources. I didn't ha- I definitely didn't have these resources uh back then when when I was in elementary school. I'm glad there are there are schools that are uh becoming more and more um uh that ha- that that are able to like have these resources nowadays. I'm really grateful for like schools like the one I work at and uh stuff like that. Yeah, and it especially amazes me that you're able to work with children and not be constantly overstimulated. Yeah, I will say I, there are points when I do become overstimulated, and what I do then is I just kind of like say, oh, I need to step out for a bit, and then someone will kind of sub in for me for like a few minutes, and then I'll like come back in. So there is still an element of overstimulation, but it's um, co- compared to like Grace's current job, I feel like the 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 stimu- like the the extent to which I get overstimulated and stuff like that is less than the um than the field I actually graduated under because or not graduated but the field I was studying under because originally I was studying to uh be in computer science and through realizing that I was like autistic and stuff like that made me feel validated in because. I, I've had internship experience working for companies like pa- Pandora and Workday as a uh, as a software engineer, and it was the and it was the most um, unstimulating work to me. I barely could get anything done. <laughs> I literally did not get a single. Yeah, I didn't get a single project done in um, when I was in when I was in Pandora. They still pay me thirty seven an hour. They haven't. They they they, they gave me my full pay. And I haven't done a single project for them. I, I'm so fucking happy about that. Anyways. <laughs> but um, Pandora, if you're listening, sorry. <laughs> wait, do you post to Pandora? No, I'm I'm just joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yeah, uh, but realizing that I was autism, and, uh, that I have autism and possibly ADHD made me feel valid and not feeling like I had to pursue this thing that I eventually was initially interested in one point, but then eventually found that wasn't the most stimulating work on the planet and stuff like that. So, so but realized, would you say you're more like, prone to understimulation? What's up? W- or would you say that yeah, you're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get, I, yeah, working just like uh, typing all day at a computer, I found very, un- uh, very unstimulating. Even, I, I even had the theory that if I worked in an industry, it was like I had an interest in because Pandora I'm very interested in music and Pandora happened to be in the field of music I thought that would be like self uh what's the word self rewarding mm-hmm. but it was still it was even more boring than the workday work I was doing yeah uh it was just bug testing and stuff I don't know how people can <laughs> wake themselves up to work 9 to 5 just sitting on a computer on day working as a teacher feels much more fulfilling to me and I feel like I'm able to make a more direct impact upon someone, especially so- me b- having me being neurodivergent. Yeah. Um, and distancing my identity from like mon- from money and stuff like that. I yeah. feel society is way too like guided by money and stuff. Mm-hmm. Again, sorry if I keep rambling. I I tend to go off on tangents sometimes. Yeah. No. No worries at all. Yeah. It's it's interesting to hear the way that you've thought about your stimulation requirements and planned your career a- around that. I've kind of done the same, but in reverse and re- in, in a way <laughs> I'm a, I'm a programmer. So I'm in office every day oh. and typing. And for yeah. me, I'm really prone to overstimulation. So being in that calming, more quiet environment and not around other people as much has helped a lot. So yeah. that's really interesting how, Autism can present in so many different ways, and some people can be really f- prone to understimulation, like you, or others yeah. can be really prone to overstimulation, like me. It's just really fascinating to see the differences in that. 
Oh yeah. I, I know it's actually a, a very interesting dynamic for me and Grace because uh, Grace tends to get overstimulated. So I tend to, well, I don't, I, I will say also can get overstimulated as well. I don't like going to parties or um, loud bars and stuff. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I cannot, I cannot handle those places that well. Um, but places like we actually went to a, uh, earlier today, we went to this, Latin, this really cool Latin American mall in Georgia and, uh, Grace, I feel, or I, I didn't feel too overstimulated there, but Grace did. And it's interesting, it's, it's interesting finding things that we both are like interested in stuff. We eventually like really found an interest in hiking and biking and stuff like that. It's very open and it's very calming. Um, and so it, it definitely, I think it definitely meets both of our like stimulation requirements and stuff like that. That's awesome. So is Grace also autistic? I am. Yes. Um, <laughs> I guess I can talk about my story. If, uh, yeah. So I, uh, I actually realized I was autistic about a year and a half ago. Um, thanks to Kelsey and thanks to Dash. Um, <laughs> I like, I don't know when I, when I met you, Kelsey, um, like, uh, last two summers ago, um, you kept insisting that I was autistic and I was like, there's no way I'm just an introvert and I just have social anxiety. And then you're like, no, you're autistic. And I'm like, okay. Um, and then, um, when I went back, uh, I, I met Kelsey over the summer during a summer internship. And then, um, I went back to college for classes. And, um, during that time I met Dash at my fraternity and literally the first time we like really ever hung out. Um, I saw Dash like cooking in the fraternity kitchen and I was like, Hey Dash, are you autistic? I've been questioning whether I have autism or not. <laughs> and I want to learn about your experience. And she was like, yeah, I am. And then, so we talked for like three hours. Um, and, uh, also oh yeah, Iris is also there. Oh, that's um, cool. And literally that night, the first time Dash and I hung out, um, he helped me actually finally like realize that I had autism, which uh, I feel bad that I didn't believe you, Kelsey, but <laughs> we got there in the end. To be clear, I didn't exactly <laughs> say you're autistic. I was talking to you and you're like, ah, oh, I have sensory issues too. And I was like, oh yeah, that's like one of the number one <laughs> traits of autism. <laughs> And yeah. then and then you, you started talking about other things you're experiencing and I'm like, oh yeah, that's another trait of autism. <laughs> and so we just kind of went back and forth at breakfast like, yep, <laughs> that's an autistic trait. That's an autistic trait. <laughs> that's an autistic trait. I thought you were just pulling stuff out of your butt. No, like, really? You I thought I was like just bullshitting? Deals with this. Yeah. Oh, sure. Know. Surely I... everyone feels pain from polyester fabrics. <laughs> <laughs> they they feel bad. Um, yeah, Did you I ever have like, those thoughts, one... like like going through your life, just thinking everyone just had to suffer through these things? Yeah. What was that well, like? Uh, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, like. Well, I think some of my family members are also neurodivergent, and so like, it, I I didn't feel completely like the, um, I don't know the odd one out because it was like I'm not doing well, but also there's another person who's not doing well, so I guess it's kind of normal. <laughs> um, I don't know. I honestly didn't question it. I was just like I. You know, going to Disney World is just a terrible, miserable, overstimulating experience for everyone, <laughs> but especially for me, um, and things like that. And um, I mean, I'm I'm also transgender, and it was very much the same kind of like every guy wants to be a girl, and turns out that's not true. And turns out I was trans and also autistic. Wow, that's um, really interesting. So you thought, yeah, you thought it was normal that every guy really wants to be a girl. Yeah, I mean, being a girl is not to be biased, but it's way cooler. Um, 
I think trans masks are valid, but I also don't understand them. I kid. Um, yeah, but like, I don't know. What, that was a joke, um, just in case anyone missed that. <laughs> yes. To any trans masculine people out there, you are the most handsome, wonderful gentleman out in the world, and I wish you the best. Oh, that's uh, cute. And yeah, anyways, when, like, one thing that I found helpful when I was like, trying to figure out if I had autism or not was like doing a bunch of research of course on like and hearing about other people's like other autistic people's experiences with autism as well as like trying the like coping mechanisms that some autistic people use and just seeing if they help even if they feel unnatural or even if like you weren't if I wasn't sure that I was actually experiencing like those kind of autistic symptoms um you mean so like, like stimming and that sort of thing yeah like i i don't know i had repressed my stimming through years and years of masking and Same. i was like when i i was like okay apparently this is this helps autistic people and it couldn't hurt to try so like in my private in like in private in my like dorm room i just tried stimming and i was like whoa this is really nice but also i'm definitely still not autistic it's just really nice it feels <laughs> nice to do this um and or like i don't know if i noticed i was like getting kind of exhausted or irritable or whatever even if i didn't understand that to be like over stimulation um or like if i was like in like a grocery market or something or a loud place like um I don't know. I never really thought to take note of how I felt from those, mm -hmm. like, uh, high amounts of stimulation. Um, and, like, trying even if I didn't really feel overstimulated at the time to, like, I don't know, step away from the noise or put in, like, uh, earbuds that help cancel out the noise. Yeah. Um, and then, like, that gave me a frame of reference of, like, oh, this is... I actually do feel better in these situations and even if I didn't really obviously make or if I didn't super consciously make like uh, a notice that like these overstimulating environments are actually overstimulating like um being able to feel that difference helped a lot in helping me like come to the realization that I did in fact have autism yeah I don't know masking is really hard to like it's tough. Um, it's the... tough because when you've masked your whole life, it's like, who am I? And and it's it's hard sometimes to even get in touch with those needs. Yeah, yeah. What was it like um, when you put in earplugs in a loud environment and, and when you started, like, really being more aware of those needs? Do you feel like maybe when you were growing up that you weren't encouraged to express your needs? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um. Yeah, honestly, it's been really, really helpful. Like, I feel so much more in tune with, like, how I'm feeling and what I need and feel, I don't know, I feel like it's a lot easier to actually take care of myself. That's awesome. Um, and not just sometimes feel really awful and irritable. Yeah. Um, like, I feel so and angry like, and I don't know why. And then, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. wait, we just exactly. went into a loud environment. That's why. <laughs> yeah um and so on that end it's been really nice um oh dash is feeding the bunny and i'm getting distracted one second <laughs> it's okay well i'm here to keep us on track <laughs> thank you i know for me when i whenever i put in earplugs it's like someone is like giving me a hug almost it's hard to describe but it's like yeah. It's like an instant calming effect, instant increase in calm. And it's just it's so, so it's wonderful. so mind blowing. It, it and I think the mind blowing yeah. part of it is that for most people wearing earplugs would just reduce the volume and that's it. For me, I feel all that neural chaos start to calm down in an instant. Mhm. Mm no, and, yeah. And I can just totally. focus and relax. I literally I put in earplugs and I can feel my body relaxing. Yeah, one hundred percent. It's wild. Um, yeah. Uh, also, CBD is found to be very helpful. Oh my god, CBD is an absolute lifesaver. Yeah. Yeah. CBD is um, is awesome. If you're overstimulated and you take even just a tiny amount of CBD, 
It helps so <laughs> much. Yeah. Um. Also, I'm gonna. This is a complete tangent, but I I need to put this out there because I like I want to rant about this. <laughs> I am transgender and queer and autistic, and what? Sorry. I didn't say anything. Dash Keep going. Okay. Um. Sorry, Dash whispered something in my ear, and I got distracted. I'm so sorry. I'm so. Sorry. It's okay. I got distracted. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I saw the bunny, and she was really fucking cute. Now we have seen the um, the the person with ADHD and autism, <laughs> and the person with only autism, um, play out where. This is ADHD honestly a great example. And then <laughs> the autism person can't switch focus quickly enough, and then forgets what she was talking about originally. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You so uh, so you you said that you're trans queer and autistic yeah yeah and um thank you for the help I appreciate you're that. welcome um and 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 there's a and like there's I don't know there's studies that like correlate uh like show a higher correlation between like trans people and autistic people um as opposed to like trans people uh, as opposed to like non uh, or I guess neurotypical people and like I don't know. I've heard a lot of people say, I, I'm sure most people don't actually care about this, but I care. So I'm going to talk about it. Go for uh, it. I've heard a lot of people say, like, I don't know, or, or like, deny, well, one, deny, like, um, gender affirming trans health care because they're autistic of like, oh, you don't know anything about yourself and like kind of infantilizing mm. autistic people and not allowing them to get the health care that they deserve. As well as, like, oh, there must be some, like, correlation between, like, uh, in the brain between, like, transgender and autism. And I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. But also, in my experience, and I'm not going to, um, I am kind of saying this is a common experience, but I'm not uh, applying this to everyone. Um, like, I think me realizing that I was transgender was crucial for me also realizing that I was autistic uh, because like Same. I I grew up like I don't know I grew up like a straight uh, very privileged like upper middle class male dude um, and like I don't know when I'm when, when it, that that's a very like closed bubble of like this is how you have to behave and this is how you have to look and this is how you have to be and I spent so much of my time trying to fit in that bubble and not doing a very good job um, but then when I came out as queer I was like I'm not in the bubble anymore I can be literally whatever whoever I want and then that helped me realize I was trans after I realized I was queer and I was like okay I can also be a girl and then with that then it's like well, I'm weird anyways. Like, I don't need to try to conform or be normal. Like, I if I'm autistic, then, like, I don't know. I feel like when I came out as, like, or when I realized I was queer, there was kind of, like, a grief period of, like, I'm not normal anymore. I'm not part of this, like... I, I know this is a very privileged uh, thing to say, but I was a very privileged kid. I really um, appreciate you sharing this perspective. I would love to hear everything about it. Thank you. Um, and I would love to info dump about it too. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, like, I don't know, like it, it, it was such a different way of thinking of like, I'm in this, I, I didn't really think about it as having to exist in this kind of box of this is what me as a straight dude needs to look like, but like, I very much spent so much of my time and energy trying to fit in that box and then it took a long time to like realize that I could even step out of that box and then realize that I was queer and then once I was out of that box then it's like the world is my oyster I can yeah. do whatever I want and, and then so you had um, a lot of so restricted like, self-expression yeah yeah exactly and yeah. so I'm not saying this is true for all autistic and trans or autistic and queer people but like I can definitely see how other people could have a similar experience to mine where like if you realize you're trans then you're already a weird person I mean okay 
trans people are not weird, but I'm using <laughs> normative language of like I'm laughing because it's relatable. Like I'm not trans, yeah. but I can relate to pretty much every single word that you've said where you feel like you're trapped into a certain box, you have to behave in a certain way, the way that you're expected to behave, and that anything outside of those expectations is unacceptable. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then from there, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm like, cripply weird. I'm, my sexuality is all over the place. I'm trans, and I'm also neurodivergent. And then it's like, I don't know, I, I'm, I graduated uh, last year with a computer engineering degree, um, but in large part due to realizing like my identity, um, I am in the process of trying to make a very uh, dramatic career shift from engineering into social work, um, specifically for like LGBTQ and uh, neurodivergent people. Because like, I don't know, I found my people. We definitely I need wanna... more allies. That's for sure. Yeah. And and I wanna and I wanna support people because because like you like people like you Kelsey who helped me when I was like trying to figure stuff out and I I wanna I wanna if if there's other people who don't have anyone like that then thank you Grace at the very least I wanna I wanna be that for others that's awesome so wanting to give other people the support that you didn't have and that inherent understanding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's um, fantastic. So then, that's that's my long rant and monologue. Yeah, um, I think that's really interesting. One thing I wanted to add to that is, I've read a lot of the research surrounding gender in the brain and the correlations between autistic people and trans people, and I'll give a, a short concise summary of my understanding it seems that there at least at this point ha there is no specific part in the brain where gender identity really is so the whole male female brain all of those types of research have actually been debunked which makes yeah makes it all the more confusing to be honest because it's like okay so if there's no woman brain and there's no man brain then how do people come up and form their gender identities and so I find it really interesting that you realized you were transgender first and then you realized you're autistic and not the other way around because I think that sometimes people maybe realize they're autistic and then because they're autistic they don't either see or conform to what is typical and, and what is what they feel would be socially required of them. So then that allows mm -hmm. them to really think about what they want outside of that bubble of conformity. I find it really fascinating that you realized you were trans first. So you, 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 you had to go, I bet that was difficult for you to go past that bubble of what you felt was expected of you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't have anything to compare it against my, I only know what my experience was like, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Like I, to be honest, I, I don't think I knew a single autistic person before you, Kelsey, which <laughs> really? I met you after I realized I was like, after I came out as trans and I had known some like trans and other queer people. All right. Yeah. I think around the time we met, that was like week four of me realizing I was autistic. Like, it was pretty really? recent. It was pretty recent. And that's why I was talking about it. Because oh. I was like, holy shit, this is like mind blowing. Like, <laughs> it was like, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Honestly, I did not realize that. Really? <laughs> uh, it was that soon after you realized you were autistic, too. I, yeah. I mean, like, the it way was you pretty, talked about it, soon. you seemed like you had like years of knowledge and experience under your belt that was like two weeks of um, hyper focus <laughs> that's, yeah that's, you know? that's some hyper fixation for you and oh yeah and and was what was i what was i yeah i really i i i like originally like i i forgot to add this but like i had the like th like throughout like i don't know since like Actually, you know what? It's funny. 
The first person who has ever told me that it could be that I could have autism was my cousin who he's like uh and I think he has autism too but um but he 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 like told me he saw some things in me and this was like when I was like maybe 14. Wow. And that was like the first time I've ever heard well it was the first time I like I knew what autism was but it was the first time I was like me autism hmm. interesting and then I was told I could have and and so it kind of like stuck in my head, what, what if I do have autism? And then uh, there's someone else who told me that I could have autism. Maybe it was my first therapist. Wow. People she actually sucked. told but, you? Like that's, that blows he, my mind. <laughs> yeah. People were like, oh, is, I like, thought I you told... knew and then just never told me. And I'm like, age 26, getting my diagnosis. Like... <laughs> The thing is, is, like, I didn't, like, really give it, well, it was something that was, like, in the back of my head, but it was, like, I told that to my mom, and my mom was, like, oh, you don't have autism. Or, like, you give eye, it's, like, the old, like, oh, you have autism, you give eye contact, or something like that. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, or, like, I know you, you you don't have autism, autism is this, uh, some preconceived notion. I was just, like, yeah, oh, okay, I guess I don't have autism. And then, yeah, then someone else told me, I think it was my first therapist, but I'm not... 100 percent sure um unfortunately there's so many harmful stereotypes about what autism looks like people think that it, it, the only form of autism is someone who doesn't make eye contact someone who throws temper tantrums and a uh, white male and there are so yeah. many ways that autism can express outside of that stereotype it's unfortunate yeah that it's exactly it, there's so much ignorance surrounding it exactly and um, and be because I've held, I've like held, and I was like, and then like after a while, I was like, even if I was autistic, then I wouldn't want to know because I don't want to have, oh, uh, I don't, I don't want to use it as a crutch. And that was my original thought, like thought about it. But then, and then eventually, like finding out that I was autistic, you know, helped me out more because it made me more aware of like what I needed, what my needs were, and how I can try to meet those needs and it kind of actually helped me get out of my depressive my, my body dysmorphia states and stuff like um depression and stuff like that and wow um and and on one hand I don't think it's good to put like say, say labels on things and say like oh you are not nor you are you are not neurotypical and stuff like that I feel like the idea of neurotypicality is derived from a it only applies to like a very specific type of person that is able to quote unquote be productive in the workplace and um stuff like that traits that are conducive to a capitalist sort of society mm -hmm. but and then people who are not people who have adhd oh they have adhd they need to take meds to be if you have adhd you need to take meds to be able to participate in society and be treated in this way and stuff and it's like ADHD people are can multitask and some people and a lot of people with ADHD cannot stand in the workplace and back and back before capitalism was a thing they were I I think I heard like people who who had like ADHD were like some of the best hunters because they could like focus in on things and stuff like that and it's only nowadays when it's considered a quote unquote issue because we have this notion of capitalism and that <laughs> And that we, everybody must work, work together to make the must work under a work, uh, work on the clock for eight hours to make number go up. But so you like, think that our society mostly sees people's worth and self worth as a measure of how productive they are, and not independently of that. I I think a lot of it is like seen as that like the note. I believe a lot of or I don't. I, I, I say a lot of this, but I, I say a lot of this without really a lot of knowledge on soci sociology and stuff like that. But I think our notion, a lot of our notions on neurotypicality is based on norms perpetuated by capitalism and how people are expected to like behave in a capitalist society. Mm -hmm. Is that controversial? I don't know. You're free to, to it, share any the, opinions you want to, even if they are controversial. I, mean, I, honestly, <laughs> I, I honestly like don't know if it's a bad take or not. Um, 
and it's, it's just like a, a theory I've kind of had that like it's good to have it's good to know what you have so you know how you want to be tr treated and how and what resource and know what resources you need and stuff like that but at the same time I don't think it's right to like Deem, like not demonize but like stigmatize these certain like types of people and be like oh you're lazy you're so and so and stuff like that I've, I yeah. feel a lot of like the notions of like laziness yeah I hate um, that word I think so it, much I, yeah uh, I, I I forget Grace you were, you were talking about like one of your psych psychology friends mentioned that like a lot of our study of psychology is like based off of the notion of like a, a very neuro typical notion or something like that. Yeah, I think that in particular the medical system is really difficult because if you're a, a neurodivergent woman who is going through different struggles and you go to a doctor and you try to talk about those struggles at best, like I mean at worst, the doctor has no frame of reference for what you're even talking about. Because there's such a yeah. gap in that cognitive empathy between, you know, if I say this fabric is the reason I'm crying, another person who has never had sensory issues might really struggle to even imagine that because of those cognitive empathy gaps. And, and so I think that definitely plays a really big role, having the communication and cognitive empathy gaps between neurotypical and neurodivergent people. It, it can make it really challenging to get the right medical care even. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you're so accustomed to just ignoring your own needs in favor of the comfort of other people. It's a big problem because you get used to that. You make that a habit and then that can be really harmful. And a, a doctor or someone might be asking you, like, how much pain are you in? And you don't know. You can't even give a number because you're not even used to being in tune with those needs. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky situation for sure. If we don't actually listen to like minority populations and what their lived experiences actually are then oh it's no wonder that we don't really do a good job at helping anybody. <laughs> yeah yeah well i have a, a question on that note i have heard that a lot of doctors aren't required to know anything about trans people's experiences and yeah. I would imagine that would be extremely difficult if you're trans and you're trying to get the care that you need and then a doctor doesn't even know what a follicle phase is. Yeah. Or like, a luteal phase. Was... Like... Um, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm so sorry. No problem. No problem. Yeah. So what? what is it like? What's your experience like with that? Is it really difficult to have doctors take you seriously? Yes. Oh, my God. So this was the start of when I was first experiencing like, um, well not first experiencing body dysmorphia, but like when I, it was kind of the trigger of how I ended up in a depression for almost two years. Like I am the, I am the type of person that, or I've, I've gotten better at this, but who like wants to make sure everything is perfect, has all their ducks in a row. I used to be very much that person. Like a, a perfectionist? Eventually, like, discovering I was autistic and stuff. Autistic and kind of realized my needs and stuff like that. I, I eventually started letting go of that and becoming better with that. Um, but uh, a while ago, when I was still very, you know, academically oriented, I used to want to make sure all my ducks were in a row. I would... Um, uh, and want to make sure everything is like going smoothly with like, with grades or like with plans and that stuff everything's like that. in and, the right way. Yeah, and that also extended to hormones and stuff. So uh. I started. Yeah, so I started um, my journey with HRT with Cumin, and it, they're they're a really great resource. Like I, um, and this was before I. I discovered I was autistic um uh they they were um they were they they are they are very accessible they are very efficient at getting people the help they need uh they're they're great they're a great co uh, company but the person the the doctor I I was given um who prescribed me my hormones 
when I started the hormones, I, I, I was, uh, I was for the most, most part fine, but it was when apparently the best way to take your, to take, um, estradiol pills for maximum efficiency because of how it's broken down in the liver is to take it under your tongue. So I, for, for a long time, I kept experiencing hot flashes or what I thought were hot flashes. And in my head, and what I've read, what read on Reddit, uh, which I uh, was that, you know, if you get hot flashes, that might mean your hormone levels are really low. So I would ask the doctor, "Hey, I'm getting hot flashes. Uh, what should I do about this?" And then he was like, "Oh, you should just drink water. You're, pro it's probably okay. It's probably just anxiety." Um, and was, and, that's the worst and response. I was just like this. Yeah, and even if it was in my head, it's still something that I felt was happening and I wanted and I needed help with. At that time, I didn't have a therapist, which I probably should have. Um, looking back now, I probably should have had a therapist I actively saw at the time. But I didn't, I didn't know it was anything more than like m medical or whatever. So I was, was like, oh, I'm, I'm probably not dissolving this efficiently. Um, maybe it's, maybe some of the estradiol is getting, I'm swallowing some of it. So I have to make sure I dissolve it perfectly. And if I don't, then that would make me anxious throughout the day and stuff like that. And then the hot flashes like still kind of continued. So then I, uh, looked up online and like, and started becoming very hyper-focused on about like how HRT works. And so then I try it like swallowing my pills orally. And then I went back to. And then I would go back to like dissolving them and then I would try injections and then I would go back to uh, pills and I would always just feel worried that my estrogen was just never working because I would feel like hot flashes or something that I would uh, ha have perceived as a reversal of my of like my progress like oh my hair is getting darker or uh, stuff like that and I would tell this to my doctor and he's like it's it's fine you're probably just anxious um and so like even though i felt like i was having all these like problems and stuff like that i i didn't i i i real i didn't know really how i could communicate my issues to them because i was like feeling something you were dismissed and yeah and i was just kind of like Im immediately dismissed so what so did you find out what it like, turned out to be it was prob it was eventually it just kind of stopped after a while like the the hot flashes so it could have just I, I eventually like found like a while later that it was just like sometimes people like when you change hormones that is just something that could happen um but i didn't know that at the time and i didn't find that information oh and so then, the doctor never communicated that with you yeah and then eventually i just I eventually I switched doctors to a different a person I could see like in person and stuff because I thought you know if they could see me I can be checked out and stuff like that and uh and and you know they seemed very caring it was a little harder to get in touch with them because instead of being online based like humid it was in person and they didn't really have a place that I can like email like my doctor and stuff I had to like put in a call and stuff like that so they were a lot less accessible accessible i later found, kind of found out and if i mentioned like an issue they would like kind of end up like kind of confused like what do you mean this or what do you mean that and stuff like that and um and eventually it's like it resulted in me getting into a really bad habit of like continually changing my hrt dose because i was really anxious about oh i see this my 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 body hair is coming back i'm getting boy smell again or something like that and this isn't working i was never assured that my hrt was doing what it should be doing so i just kept changing shit and that mm. messed with my mental space and i eventually had to like stop school for a while because it was just so bad um, yeah yeah that sounds friend... difficult i would yeah, really i would really be curious to hear from your perspective and from grace's perspective what does it feel like to have that body dysmorphia yeah i mean at least for me it was like i would like look in the mirror and i'll be like I am visibly reverting because of this, or I, I mean, that's how it manifested for me because that is kind of like how I associated with like my anxiety about hormone levels and stuff like that. I was like, I am reversing this looks mask and the HRT is not going to work and is not working and so on. It's like stuff that 
you know, I would, I would like talk to my friend Iris and she would be like, I don't see any reversals. I don't see any like even big changes either. So it's like, um, so it's like it looking back, it was almost definitely in my head. But then even when I thought like my, my first therapist and the reason why I switched was because her response to everything was just kind of confusion. Like she was supposed to be a specialist in like gender care. And I would just be like, I'm feeling like I'm, I'm having this or I'm feeling like that I'm having that is this normal and she'd be like I don't know what you're talking about and I just felt completely invalidated by that person so I switched therapists and yeah I'm um, sorry you had that experience it can be really tough to communicate how you're feeling and what you're experiencing to have someone yeah. to, who can actually receive it especially in the medical field and I, I wish there were I wish there was a way that that could be improved same and yeah like I would like even like I mean, I feel like with people who have autism and stuff like that may, like, and how they can be in tune to, like, certain things and not other things, like, there's just kind of a realm of experiences that is kind of hard to communicate to a neurotypical person. And luckily, I did find um, another therapist that was a lot easier to talk to about these things. And they and they were able to help me a lot with a lot of my uh, anxieties with hormones, um, which, you know, on top of being, you know, diagnosed with autism and um and um and having my friend iris who helped me through a lot of my like bad depressive moments i was kind of able to like you know kind of chill out about stuff oh yeah and also psychedelic usage of course that that also helped but um but yeah so so yeah that's that's at least how the body dysmorphia manifests in me now it's now it's now it's here's grace with the weather <laughs> So Grace, what does it feel like for you to have body dysmorphia? Like I so I'm I'm not trans, so it I'm asking because it's it's hard to really imagine um what that would feel like from uh, from your perspective. I would definitely be interested in, in hearing about that. Kelsey, imagine if you had like really thick body hair all over your body and like a beard and stuff. Okay. And I don't know, like the beard alone sounds like I... sensory hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, really quickly, there's a, as far as I'm aware, there's a bit of a distinction between dysphoria and body dysmorphia. Um, dysphoria, I think, is closer to what Grace was describing, but dysmorphia is more like when I see things in the mirror that aren't really there, and it can impact both cis and trans people equally like for me when i like looked in um the mirror like i would be like oh this is like this is uh this does not look femme or like oh this is like becoming like thicker and and stuff like that and what whereas hormones helped my dysphoria i still had a lot of dysmorphia because of my anxiety over hormones. I just wanted to add in that clarification. Yeah, thanks for adding that. I, I appreciate that distinction. I think that's definitely important to, to keep in mind. So, yeah, so, sorry for interrupting. So dysmorphia is like when you are looking in the mirror and, and something seems like it misshapen or out of place, that sort of thing? Yeah, and that's, and that's I believe, like stuff like bulimia, like you know, believing you're like thinking you're a fat, but you're not actually fat and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so like for me, it's like I'm looking it's like I'm looking at a different person than how people would normally perceive me as I'm seeing things. Yeah, like like like, like I think perception is entirely like sub like a subjective and stuff like that. And I can like look at myself in the mirror in like two completely different ways and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So like, when I'm just when I have when I was like really dysmorphic and stuff like that, I would look in the mirror and be like, "This is referring, this is that, this is bad." But written reality, you know, mm -hmm. that wasn't really happening and stuff like that. So I bet that um, would feed in a lot to the dysphoria, wouldn't it? Yes. Oh, definitely. Jason's back with the weather. Hi, it's me with the weather. Trans <laughs> people are valid. Um. Oh. Oh. All of that to say, Dash turned out to be the most beautiful woman in the world. Aww. Shit. Just, 
tell you, Grace. Here's the here's the thing is. Can you the kiss attack? Um. Yeah, I don't know. Dysphoria sucks. I thankfully haven't um experienced like uh the extent of like dysmorphia and anxiety that Dash um experienced. Um, but like, yeah, dysphoria is the absolute fucking worst. And um gender affirming healthcare is literally life saving medication. Um Yeah, I don't know, like to be it, able to be yourself. Yeah. Like before I realized I was trans, I don't know, I just like never I I had uh what's it called when you like push an emotion down and don't allow yourself repression to... or sub suppression. Yeah, I repressed Thank you, yeah. I repressed a lot of um that dysphoria and um like didn't really ever care to take care of myself and just never I, I don't know, I, I it 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 led to a lot of like depression and apathy and just not caring for my body at all and then when i was like oh i'm trans um then that helped like unrepress or unsuppress a lot of those things and um like um yeah i don't know i i, I just for an example of what dysphoria be like sometimes um i've struggled with voice dysphoria um i am a trans femme but i have a pretty mask voice still um and um a bit ago i was talking to my therapist about like uh my voice dysphoria and during that conversation with my therapist like the dysphoria hit me so hard that like i couldn't bear to hear myself talk anymore but i was also still like chatting with my therapist and so I just, like, in pure misery, it, it was like, I have a mouth, but I can't speak. And I want to talk to you about what I'm feeling, but doing so requires me to talk. And that is such an unbearably unpleasant and wow. like, um, awful experience that I am now just sitting in silence crying. So um, you, do you think that dysphoria triggered selective mutism? Um, I guess you could describe it as that. It didn't really feel mute, like, because I could technically, I mean, I could still talk. It was just, like, talking was such a strong reminder that, hey, you sound like a guy, that I couldn't deal with that pain at that time, and so I chose not to talk. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's rough. I'm sorry that you have to go through that. Thanks. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a, transitioning has been a very difficult, but very, very rewarding journey. I, it, it's been such a incredible thing to be able to look in the mirror, uh, over the months and like more times than I've ever in the past, like actually be happy with how I look. And that's just not an emotion or an experience that I've ever had before, before, uh, like, uh, before I started transitioning. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, I will also say, um, sure as hell would be a lot nicer if, uh, the world wasn't so antagonistic towards trans people. Please. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And unfortunately, I think that a lot of the... A lot of the antagonistic tendencies comes from ignorance. People are afraid of what they don't know. And uh, I think that's why it's so important to share your story because people don't have any alternate perspective to, to hear. If they've never talked to someone who's different from them, if they've never even thought about someone who's different from them, podcast episodes like yeah. these are I mean, you you could be helping and affirming millions of people right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I also do want to point out. I think uh, when a lot of people talk about like being transgender, 
a lot of it is focused on like dysphoria and a lot of the negative emotions associated with being trans. I also to clarify that not all trans people experience dysphoria and they are also valid. Um, but like, um, I don't know, for me, just to make things clear and to try to help change, uh, I don't know, help reframe the narrative on trans people. Like for me, my experience of being trans has most clearly been an experience of like learning to love myself and accept myself and be the person that I want to be. And there's been a lot of pain along the way and a lot of things are difficult and suck. But for me, I feel like tr being trans is such a positive and wonderful thing. And I'm very proud and happy of who I am. That's so fantastic. I I'm really glad to hear that. I think that I think sometimes people can get trapped in the perceptions of themselves and, and of how others see them to the point where they lose touch with their needs. But it sounds like that by realizing you were trans, it has allowed you to get in touch with your needs and how you want to live your life. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And that's so um, important, especially if you grew up in a way to be continually expected to just ignore your your own needs whether that's from a sensory perspective or whether that's from a gender perspective i think it's awesome that you're doing that self-analysis to be able to to recognize who you are thank you um yeah i, I really like the way you put that of like um learning to recognize and um actually take care of your needs as a human being it's um, tough people don't always teach yeah. you how to do that <laughs> i certainly wasn't taught thank you dash for being a cool people teacher <laughs> <laughs> so i would love to ask since both of you are trans and both of you are autistic i, I bet that bring you a lot closer in many ways yeah. because you have yeah. a similar yeah, life experience Yes. Yes. When you met, was it like, holy shit, she's on my wavelength? What was it like? Yes. <laughs> she, 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 she is so, oh, like, I could never ask for a better girlfriend. She is the best person in the planet. Aww. <laughs> I'm saying this on live television. This is the best <laughs> girlfriend ever. All oh your god. girlfriends fucking suck. Oh my suck. god. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That can categorically not be true because Dash is actually the best girlfriend ever. <laughs> um, but I will say, yeah, being being trans and autistic uh, together has been really fun and cool. We, go, we, we, we talk about so many things and have a lot of self-realizations and learn a lot from each other. And also stim a lot. We stim a lot. I'm slapping her face right now. Yeah. I'm committing domestic abuse. I'm scratching her arm right now. I'm <laughs> being nice though yeah um i'm so glad that you were able to find each other and find another partner who really understands from a first person perspective what it's like yeah oh yeah for like the longest time of like i don't know i've had so much trouble like i don't know being what's the word um committed in a relationship or or engaged whatever the word is i don't know yeah like, that's Yep. My, I mean, my my first, I guess, uh, ser serious partner was long distance anyway, so that already made things difficult. My next partner, who was trans and also like, in, um, and also happened to not be a million miles away, um, was a lot. Was it was it was it was better from the distance, but at the same time, I, I don't know, I. It just felt it was like hard to like really like vibe and like feel like really deeply and stuff like that, and um, and honestly, like the first person, what was it like dating a neurotypical person? Have I dated a neurotypical person? <laughs> um, oh yeah, the person that watched The Office. That's right. That's right. Um, so. <laughs> Sorry to sorry to all the office fans. Uh, it's a <laughs> it's a it's a show. Um, so um, I mean, 
it just it always felt really hard to relate to another person or express myself like the like it or express myself the like truly freely and stuff and i never i don't know i never felt like i could fuse together with this person and become one and it wasn't until and it wasn't until grace where i kind of found that person and and grace well grace being the little like humble little 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 thing that she is is always like oh, i'm okay and stuff like that but like literally like i don't know i just i just feel for her so much and stuff like that and i just want to protect her at all costs she is she is like like if i i didn't really know like what love could feel like until i met her and then she like and it's just like this is love her and she's, she's amazing I that's know. fantastic I, I I am this is why I say I'm like despite the challenges I've put up with like through school and through depression and shit I'm happy where I ended up be- I'm happy I'm even happy that I took as long as a or as many years off as I did because otherwise I wouldn't have met Grace that's and awesome I would, and, I, and I wouldn't be here in this cool little gay not gay commune but uh, I, I live in a commune uh that's like really cool and stuff um and and yeah i'm really happy and i'm really happy i i i i was i was able to understand like what closeness like really meant in love was through grace and this is why i say grace is the best girlfriend on the planet (laughs) that's awesome yeah it's it's incredible to be able to emotionally connect with another person who just gets it and gets it in a way that you don't even have to explain it it. Sorry about being autistic right now. <laughs> you don't ever have to apologize for being who you are, okay? That I that say, for me that is <laughs> the the like she gets it is, is 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 so true for me too. Like I remember, I, I don't know, like I Dash was the first person I ever dated, um, and. I don't know how I landed with such a perfect individual on the first uh, time, but I am not complaining. She is amazing and perfect and wonderful. Um, but like, I, I don't know. I remember thinking a lot of the times of like, if I ever get a partner, I guess all of these things that I am and like to do and all of my passions, I will kind of just have to put them aside and hide them That's for so my partner sad. because they're too weird and, like, how could anyone ever accept me like this? I'm, th- this stuff has got to go. Um, and um, I don't know. I'm so thankful that, like, I, I, D- Dash has been so accepting and affirming of, like, everything that I am. And, like, um, uh, especially with, like, autism, like, I can just be goofy and stim and, like, get overstimulated and, uh, like, be autistic, be an autistic motherfucker, um, <laughs> and like you don't have to suppress I yourself never or I would have the freedom to actually be fully myself. No bars held back. I don't know what that phrase is. English phrases suck. Um, I'm so glad that you have found someone with. you can be free with. Yeah, without yeah, needing to suppress so yourself, moment. you can just say what's on your mind speak directly and not have to mask yeah dash is staring at me really scared of me. <laughs> I love um well i had i had another question for you too what what do you wish that the world knew about autism and in the way that autistic people live their lives um, we're, um, I feel like it's, like, st- stigmatized and shit like that, and of course there's all these, like, oh, autistic people are like this, or autistic people don't stare and stuff, but it's like, we're all <laughs> around you, we're invading your homes, I'm just kidding, um, but, um, like, I don't know, we're nice people, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think, like, at least for me, I don't think my autism is a bad thing. I am glad I am the weird, goofy little thing that I am. And 
and and I don't have to be I don't have to be your friend and stuff like that. And I understand that there's like certain people like who like you know what will, will immediately not vibe with someone who's autistic, but I don't know. Like I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm not gonna bite you. Um I'm I, I'm I'm nice and I have a lot of cool things to talk and I have a lot of cool things to talk about. So if you ever want to info dumps about anything, uh <laughs> That's I, awesome. I, I, I've, there's, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of good about autism, at least for for me, and how I've kind of was able to self actualize and stuff like that. Because you're That's right. because you're more likely to to be yourself and, and to follow the things that you're actually interested in instead of just doing it to please others. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's some awesome self-acceptance, Dash. I'm really glad that you were able to get to that point. It's not easy. A lot of people struggle to get to that, to be able to look at themselves and, and think, you know, I'm I'm a pretty cool person. Thank you. Um, I'll say on my end, this goes for autistic people and for anybody else. Um, hold space for others and meet people where they are even if you disagree with them and like have judgments on what they're saying or who they are like definitely um, like if an autistic person is talking about their experience might not be the best idea to like deny that they're experiencing that and yep can we have some <laughs> more empathy and like compassion in the world i think that is uh, both for autistic people and for literally every human being on the planet. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing that I, that, that, that is really cool. Yeah. I know it's a very general answer, but. That sentiment is definitely shared. And I think a lot of times what is so difficult is that the expression of empathy for autistic people can be really different from the expression of empathy for a neurotypical person. So when you're when you're talking about people holding space and being more empathetic to what you're going through, what does that look like for you? Um, that's a really good question. Um, for me, I really appreciate like I, I feel like I've had so many conversations where I am going through some stuff and I tell someone about it and then I'm just met with like what feels like a wall of solutions and answers. And I appreciate that other people want to help, but like, and, and I know this is something that I struggled with a lot myself, um, and still often do. Um, it's very easy to like want to fix people's problems and offer solutions, and um, I don't know. Ninety percent of the time, for me at least, like it, it feels so much better to be heard first and yeah. like just i i i don't know the the classic i don't need answers i need someone to listen to me like it's it's true and it, it is real and it like does actually make a difference in people definitely um, someone to just listen yeah. to what you're going through without trying to fix it yeah and like if you have a solution that you think might help, like, you know, um, I, I think the approach of like collaboratively exploring options together, um, and like taking a more mutual approach to like, if, if they do want to find a solution, then like, I think that's something that can absolutely be done together. Uh, but yeah. Anyways, so what were you gonna say, Dash? Um, and in terms of like, you know, giving you know autistic people like you know empathy and stuff like that, I re I think a really good way to and this goes for like any sort of organization that like deals with some social cause. Have pe if you're like, don't just be a committee of people who call themselves professionals. Also have people. Who have personal experience with the thing on that committee like yeah yep. that autism <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> say autism must 
is a plate on society and it's a hardship on everybody. Like, have people who are autistic on your committee helping yeah. you, like, instead of becoming an elimination sort of group, like, I don't know, an advocacy group, have, and maybe the autistic people can, like, tell you how they want to be advocated for. Yep. Um, and Mic drop. <laughs> or if you're, like, trying to, like, solve some sort of, like, I don't know, food crisis in Uganda, have... Have some Ugandan farmers on your committee. Don't just say, be like, oh, we're professionals and we're going to prescribe this shit for you because, like, I don't know. I, I, I it, does, it doesn't seem to 100% work for everybody and their needs if you don't really know what their needs are. Yep. Just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Couldn't have said it better myself with that, Dash. Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of research gets trapped in this if it's not normal, must be deficient mindset, which I really don't agree with. Right. Yeah, 100%. And it's a shame, because imagine the type of research, the caliber of research, and the variety of research that we could get without that. Exactly. Then yeah. I might actually be able to find actual research about autistic women. <laughs> instead of just yeah. finding it all about children or or research about or men <laughs> yeah or expecting fertility doctors to know about trans issues and hormones I feel like yeah. that shouldn't be such a large gap but it is right yeah definitely agree with that I may be different, but I'm also deficient in vitamin D. I should go outside more. <laughs> That's funny. And um, so is there anything else that you'd like to talk about before we end our podcast today? How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing good. I good. just oh. made a shirt that doesn't trigger sensory issues, so I'm pretty happy with that. That's good. How is, have, how, how, what has, how has, um, how has, how has, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, Greece <laughs> with the weather. <laughs> um, it's been rainy as fuck. What was I going to say? I hate small talk so goddamn much. <laughs> Holy I hate small talk too. People always do small talk about everything. Can we talk about how? <laughs> what, wait, wait, what was your experience with the small talk? You're like when you were at the arcade. Oh my god, I was at like a company fucking lunch, and oh my god, it was the most miserable thing in the world. It was at an arcade, which is just the most overstimulating place ever. Flashing lights and noises from a thousand directions, and so many people just. Uh, it was awful. And then during the lunch, like, literally everybody, no one would, n everyone refused to do anything but the worst, just most, like, awful small talk in the world. And I, like, randomly asked a person who I knew had a kid recently, like, what's it like being a dad? Because I want to have an actual fucking conversation about something <laughs> cool and interesting. And he was like, it's I." Right. And then went back to small talk. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> So you're over there shit. trying to connect with him and asking, like, showing interests and asking the right questions, and then you just shut down. Yeah. That's rough. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the silver lining is that I did, uh, at a different table, I, I met an autistic, uh, cool person who um, I got to learn a lot, lot about, like, bike routes in Atlanta area. So that, was, that, was, that made the rest of the lunch better. That's awesome. This is exactly why, you know, having representation is so important cuz if you if you go and join a new group or you go to a lunch and no you feel like you can't relate to absolutely anyone in the slightest, it's really kind of isolating. Yeah, yeah. It, because it's not that you don't want to relate. I mean, you're over there actually trying to talk to this other guy about what's it like being a dad. I feel like that's a pretty open-ended question and I'm surprised you didn't get more more of an answer there. Yeah. I, I know that a lot of yeah. people, a lot of people would probably be very happy to tell you everything about their children. <laughs> I'm very surprised yeah. that that was a topic that was shut down so quickly. Yeah. Um, I will say one realization I 
had somewhat recently is like I was amazed that it I, I always feel like uh, oftentimes in the group of people who are just making really awful small talk like I feel like I'm the only one who's in misery right now and who actually wants to have a real discussion. Um, but the more I've felt comfortable, like, opening up and actually starting those deeper discussions, like, it, it, a lot of people, I was surprised, and I think a lot of other people will be surprised if, like, you try this, like, a lot of other people also feel the same way and want to have yeah. more meaningful discussions on actual topics. Definitely. Um, but also feel like, oh, but it's not societally normal to do that. And mm -hmm, so we just mm -hmm. keep on forever. Yeah. And, um, I, I also wanted to mention know, that, like, most people actually do get dopamine from those surface level conversations. Really? What? They do. What? I know. It was a total game changer. They actually get dopamine from those surface level conversations. And because sharing that. less is like sharing more, so a lot of people are afraid to share things about themselves because they're afraid of being judged. So, and they still get that dopamine even from those really surface level conversations. So what, what happens is that people want to be around other people and quote vibe with those other people without actually sharing information and it makes it difficult for us because most neurodivergent people connect over shared information and not over the general vibe of the room so there's even what a disconnect the there <laughs> I want shared information what the <laughs> that was my reaction when I found out too I was like you're telling me that when I say good morning to someone they get like a little dopamine reward from that and they do most people do and in fact I bet most people listening to this would probably be shocked to hear that a lot of us don't get that <laughs> oh. <laughs> so ever since learning that I think it helped a lot with small talk because I Instead of it be becoming a chore, like, I have to do this because it's required socially everywhere I go, it became more of a, I do, I, I kind of would like to make other people feel that surface level happiness. And it helped a lot. It helped, it helped tremendously because then I was a lot less focused on how boring it was for me and more interested, like, wow, other people are actually getting happiness out of this. That's a really interesting perspective. Yes. So maybe that helps a little bit. It definitely yeah. blew my mind to discover that. <laughs> it sounds like understanding yourself and other people better helped you reframe small talk in a way that made it more like enjoyable for you. Yeah, because even if I don't get that dopamine feedback, if I know that other, other people are getting that, it makes it a lot more palatable. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Like, would I prefer to talk about your plan for the alien apocalypse? Heck yeah, I would. I would much rather talk about that than what the weather is currently doing. But, unfortunately, when you're in a professional environment, there are a lot of restricted topics. <laughs> and a lot of people wouldn't yeah. be interested in talking about the alien apocalypse, uh, what-if scenarios. So, sticking to those surface-level conversations is also a way to get through it through that it blew my mind when i learned that there are like hidden rules of like neurotypical like culture and stuff like that and like some people will like say like one thing and then mean something completely different or like yep give like an expression that means something and i'm just like wait you were saying that this whole time yep yeah that the there ha that has a name and the name for that is called subtext and i am pretty blind to subtext as well. I've gotten better at it in the last couple years, but it's still really difficult because reading be reading between the lines, it's really hard to describe it, but it's like a blindness. It's 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 there is some kind of a binary factor where y other you want to communicate with another person, but it's like you're speaking two different languages. Yeah. Yeah. That's that 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 gave me a lot of trouble when I was younger, like trying to learn how to socialize with other people. Yeah. Um, 
and to go off on a bit of a tangent, like, um, I am currently working to transition into a social worker out of engineering, and I want to become a therapist specifically. Um, awesome. And for like the past two, three years, ever since I realized that this is what I'm passionate about doing, like, because of all of the trauma of like, feeling like I'm just the absolute worst at talking to people um, and trying so desperately hard to mask and be socially competent uh, in a neurotypical way and failing miserably at it at every step of the way. I'm like, I, I just felt completely hopeless of like, I don't know how to have conversations with people i feel like my brain is fundamentally broken and i am just hopeless and i'll never be able to pursue this thing that i want to pursue um and i struggled with that for several for like a couple of years um and thankfully through meeting a bunch of more neurodivergent people and learning about myself and through a bunch of therapy like um i realized that masking and um like I don't actually have to operate in conversations that way and I can learn to interact with social situations in a way that works better with me and my brain. That's and, awesome. Um, after realizing that like I felt so fucking hopeful and happy and rejuvenated of like I feel like I've unlocked the secret of like I don't have to try to be someone that I'm not in order to interact with people. I can just interact with people in a way that works for me. Yeah. And um, so I've been That's awesome. actually pursuing that path now. To realize um, you're not a broken neurotypical person, but you're a totally yeah. whole neurodivergent person yeah. who still has worth. Yeah. It That's turns awesome. out when I was uh, reading How to Win Friends and Influence, Pe Influence People and watching a bunch of YouTube videos on how to be more charismatic and how to have better conversations for hours and hours and hours on end and reading articles and trying to copy people's, uh, like, uh, copy people's uh, way of interacting and forming very complicated, uh, comprehensive, like, um, I don't know, algorithms? trees of... Algorithms, yeah, of, like, if someone says this and this is what I say and yep. I need to have every single conversation pre uh had in my brain or else Scripted. I will yeah. completely feel like conversing. Um That's what masking looks like to the listener. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever see yourself doing that um, <laughs> if if you see yourself you memorizing might, yeah. 350 <laughs> rules for a basic social interaction, you might be <laughs> neurodivergent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing, but I'm also serious. Like, I could probably write down 350 social rules. <laughs> Honestly, same. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> um, on a, if, I don't know if you've seen the show The Rehearsal by Nathan Felder. That was so fucking good. It, uh, not to spoil too much, but it covers topics, uh, adjacent to this kind of, um, uh, adjacent to this and it's it's a very good show i do highly recommend and also felt like a sucker gut sucker punch to my gut when i watched it first yeah well thank you for sharing your experience about what masking is like i think that hearing that is going to be really eye-opening for a lot of people because if you don't have to mask i mean it's, it's mind-boggling to think that 95 percent of people just don't don't really have to mask or maybe they are masking but they're really good at that context switching behind it so they don't realize there's effort behind it that's another possibility too yeah i'm really happy that yeah. both of you were able to accept yourself for who you are and to be able to take off the mask particularly around each other because when you're masking all the time it can be really difficult it can create burnout really quickly yeah. I wonder if there's, like, anybody, like, who's in a relationship and they feel, like, unsat like unsatisfied and stuff like that, and they don't know that they have, like, autism and stuff like that. 
I would say there's don't... probably a lot of cases like that, Dash. Aww. A lot of people even have to mask around their partner, which kind of blew my mind. Really? Yeah. I definitely can't relate to that. I got lucky to have a guy who will accept me f- exactly for who I am without needing to mask. But there are quite a lot of people, uh, quite a lot of autistic people that h- have to mask t- literally 24-7. Who would want to... That sounds so exhausting. Like, I feel like if you come up to your, like, your significant other, like... Well, it's it's kind of out of ignorance, I think. If you don't know you're autistic, then you think you have to just try to force yourself to socialize in the same ways as everyone else. And it affects everything. Yeah, that's true. I mean, before I knew I was autistic, I was like, is this what being in a relationship feels like? I mean, it's been, like, so much effort to, like, I don't know exists with the other person yeah well we're coming to the end of the episode but I I did want to say one last thing to both of you I am really really glad that in your journey discovering that you're transgender and discovering that you're also autistic I'm really glad that it hasn't resulted in a desire to create like a fake version of you you know what I mean both of you are on this life journey to be authentic, to be yourself, because you you wouldn't want to be anyone else. You're going to show up as who you are, whatever that looks like, and I can't applaud you enough for that. Aw, thank, thank you. you. I will say, I have tried to turn myself into fake versions of me throughout this process many times, and every time it <laughs> crashes and burns. Um, but I, I appreciate that. Yeah. And likewise for yourself. Thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I think it can, but... it can get really difficult when you're when you're trying to create a new perception of yourself and still in that process you don't really know how to be yourself authentically it can be difficult to learn how to do that but it's really important yeah yeah thanks well thank you both so much for being on the podcast I, i really appreciate it it was awesome to have you on here Thanks for having us, Kelsey. Yeah, Kelsey, more like Coolsy. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate sure the that, nickname. Uh, yeah, make 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 sure this part is in the in the in the in the in the published podcast. This is important. Everyone should know that this is cool. The Coolsy, Kelsey. <laughs> All right, I promise to include that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Thank you, everyone, awesome. for listening. That I have us. A fridge full of string cheese and it can't get any colder. <laughs> That's funny. Well, thank you everyone for listening and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks, Colsey. <laughs> <laughs>